we're making the important decision up here whether it's sparkling or still. <laughs> yeah, you, ch you charge more for the sparkling. Absolutely. We had to put the gaffs in it. You haven't got any sparkling over there. Still, it's enough sparkle on the stage. There's we no don't sparkle need more in easy oh. <laughs> You can see where this is going. Right, we, let's begin. Um, 2023, in, in some shape or form, You've all said it will be, in conversations, you've all said that it will be better than last year, which is a fairly low bar. But how much better, and how are you going to prepare for the strikes that's going to make it very difficult? You can all jump in at any point. Start with you, Jan. No, look, I mean, there's no doubt that, you know, the 2023, that's where we're starting to see, you know, really the big volumes coming back. And, you know, you asked me the question before, you, you turned the question around to say, how bad, you started to question me to say, how bad will 2023 get? And the question is, how good will 2023 get? First of all, we But you're taking a very low here. bar of last year. No, but look, you know, we're now seeing demand is coming back. And we haven't talked about the fact that, you know, we did not you know, think for two years ago that, you know, we're going to see that much pent-up demand coming back at the same time. And the question is whether it's a pent-up demand or it is a new level of demand. Are people just burning through savings that they had since the pandemic or is actually this a new level of demand? And I think probably it's a mix. Are you ready? Yes, we are. But that's not so much the, the whole point as we discussed today. We are one part of the, 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 the sector. And, right. you know, the, the, our performance goes down to the, how strong is the weakest link in the chain? And that's one of the issues. Okay, but if I look at uh, your airlines, uh, Carsten, the, you know, Frankfurt's been closed because of strikes. This week it was Munich that got hit uh, because of strikes. The ability of different actors to cause chaos in the industry has never been greater. I agree, but coming back to this idea of looking more positively on aviation, why do they choose aviation, at least in Germany and I'm sure in other countries? Because it's such a visible, interesting industry, attracting attention of the media, attracting obviously you know, the attention you want with a strike. So I think I don't want to talk down the issues of this summer, and I have not done that in other formats, but let's really keep that positive spirit after three years of not operating. Even if you only get to 90% regularity, which would be a worst year in history of aviation, it will not get there. We are providing, you know, jobs again to the tourism industry. We are allowing people to take a vacation who haven't done so for years. So I think we need to keep that the glass is half full approach, even if this year it's only 60% full instead of 70. And I really believe also you're not known to be a negative person, but even you are starting this conversation now with how bad will the summer get? Come on, where have we come from? Yeah, China is opening up. Uh, people in the tourism industry, like the lady from Malta was just explaining, uh, being able to find jobs again, whatever happened this summer, we recreated connectivity in Europe. And that must be our overall, I think, attitude. Also towards lobbying, like Michael and myself and Johan, of course, we know how to complain. It's part of our jobs. There's so many things to complain. And if we didn't do a show, this press conference this morning. But in the end, we need to keep that positive approach. That's something which we were not able to provide to our customers for years, which was obviously unimaginable is now there. So since this is a for do you think that is a message that needs to be refined and put out? That look where we were, look where we're going, because otherwise a few bad days of transport ca travel chaos destroys the, the message that you're trying to get out. Well, I'm, I'm willing to say now here in March there will be a few bad days this summer. So I think coming back to the question, I absolutely agree. We have to defend ourselves from allowing a few bad days, ruining the build-up of our industry, including the image of our industry. How do you do that? Sitting here on your CEO debate, um, trying to get emotional messages across. You know, I talked about this wonderful IATA movie we had a few years ago, The World of Flying or something. There must be more of that. I think also Airlines for Europe is preparing an emotional campaign 
uh, rather than just complaining about single European sky not existing, which is better. Which we'll come to in a moment. Good. So I think our staff, uh, we, is everything perfect in aviation? No. But is it better than other industries? You all want to work in a bank or an insurance company? Maybe not. So I think we need to twist that around. I really think so. Michael, um, is your glass half full or half empty or whatever? I think it is uh, three quarters full. Look, I think this summer is going to be materially better than last summer was. Uh, last summer, the industry was kind of surprised by the dramatic recovery of air travel, having come out of a second COVID spike at Christmas, and then you had the invasion of Ukraine in February. These were monumental events. People stopped recruiting, stopped training. Airports were caught short-staffed. A number of airlines were caught short. Everybody in the supply chain was caught, short, caught short-staffed. I think the airlines and the airports have done a terrific job in the last 12 months of gearing up for this summer. I think from a staffing perspective, the airport's security, uh, the airlines will do reasonably well. Uh, but you take, go back to the fundamentals. There is still going to be less short haul capacity in Europe this year than there was pre-COVID. Uh, I think Europe will operate about 90, 95% of pre-COVID capacity. The Americans are going to invade Europe this summer. There's been a very strong dollar for the last 12 months. The forward bookings on all the transatlantic stuff are incredible, probably at record levels, a strong dollar. They're going to be wandering around the golf courses and the bars and restaurants of Europe this summer. The Asians are beginning to return, and the Europeans are going to holiday within Europe for the, uh, uh, this year as well. So we're heading for a very strong summer. I think it's unfair to characterize how much it would be chaos. Look, we're in Brussels. I mean, Brussels, there's somebody always on strike. I mean, the metro's always on strike. Nobody pays any attention to it because it's Brussels and they're always on strike. There will be strikes. The ATC one is the most frustrating one because they just won't. I mean, it's recreational striking in France. It's very hard to explain to our passengers at an airport in Germany or in Spain why their flight is cancelled because the French are okay. on strike. But other than that, I think this will be a dramatically better, stronger right. summer for air travel than last summer. All right. So, did you want to? No. I, I want to take, because I heard what you said, and I heard what all of you said about this uh, in, in the press conference. However, if the industry, if there's going to be these strikes, and the Commission knows full well the ability to uh, allow overflight, why do you think they're not doing it, any of you? Why is the Commission not assisting you over overflights in the, for the summer? Well, firstly, I think the, the, the current Commission likes to, will devolve in priority towards doing nothing. I mean, their preferred modus operandi is do nothing and hope that the problem goes away. Uh, we're not asked to do much. Eurocontrol wrote to them in September this year and said, why don't you prioritize the overflights? If there's going to be national ATC strikes, require the domestic, uh, cancel the domestic flights. I mean, everybody in Europe already does this. If there's a French ATC strike, all the long haul stuff, the transatlantic and the Asians get priority. They're never canceled. The French domestic flights are protected by French domestic, uh, by minimum service legislation. And all we're asking is that the European Commission extend that to the overflights there will still be some cancellations, but the overflights should not take all of the cancellations so that you protect the French domestic flights. Well, it, it, it's strong local political powers. It, it's politics in these countries that, that stops these things. But, you know, there is a, uh, it, it, it's tremendous when you actually are having meeting with people also in their respective countries about this, that there's nobody who dis I haven't met anybody of politicians this decision, decision making who doesn't agree that we should do the airspace reform in a smaller room than this. But then mm, it's this, it's difficult, you know, this pressure here and there. But I think that there is a there's a narrative now on sustainability and the CO2 savings that we got to do a better job with them before to actually say, look, here is a low hanging fruit that is the cheapest way on how you're going to reduce CO2 emissions from there. You cannot not take this opportunity. Oh, except that they have. They have successfully not no. taken this opportunity over but the many focus, years. Richard, the focus, Richard, has never been so great on sustainability. You got the, you know, the Green Deal industrial plan, you get the Net Zero Act, you get all those investments that goes into this. And at some point, people are sitting and saying, look, what are we getting for the buck here? What are we getting for the money in here? Well, the cheapest way you can achieve saving is to introduce the airspace reform. Carsten, does that mean that collectively, 
you have to go, I won't use the word on the attack, but you have to start getting tough. You have to get a stronger message, both to people and to politicians, that if they do not do something, there is a consequence that they will face. Yeah, but I agree with you one. This morning in our board meeting, I said, there is a new currency in town, which is CO2. Historically, we complained about money we lose or passenger comfort we lose, our passengers. That obviously didn't get us very far. Flying was still perceived as something luxurious. Big companies usually don't get the pity of politicians anyway. Now it's different. This important thing of CO2, where we are doing so many painful things to save, by it suddenly have an easy solution to save so much of it. I think that would, not this summer, but this will change the debate. And also we have to be, which I try to be when I meet politicians, tough on revoking ideas where we should do things which are either expensive or damaging passenger comfort, but at the same time, the most obvious thing is not done. But then I listened to the commissioner this, uh, this morning, and she says, I don't understand why the national governments won't take these actions. And I sort of, since I have the luxury of talking to you in this form, I didn't want to sort of say to her, yeah, but isn't it your job to make them? Yeah, but I think they have to be a little bit fair. I mean, where is their power really to do this? Is it just a question of willingness? We all agree there should be more willingness, don't get me wrong. But the fact is, if Germany or France, because of the pressure of the unions, don't agree to do this, any commissioner in the world can run around and won't be able to achieve it. Do we see the right level of trying? I agree with Michael, not at all. Should we be naive and saying, if just somebody in Brussels wakes up in the morning and tell, I will now call Paris and then I call Berlin and I will now tell him it's over, the European sky will happen. This is not how Europe works. The member states are very powerful in this balance of power. And uh, some of the countries, obviously, which depend most on aviation or how strong players in aviation don't go along. It's part but, of the truth. But you have a powerful tool to play, each of you in your respective countries, because you're right in the sense of the central body here, but you can play in individual countries where you fly to and get messages out individually. I think, I think it's, it's naive to expect individual countries. Are the French ever going to reform Fre you know, French ATC? No. You know, and Karsten is right. The, the countries are powerful. But Aviation would never have been deregulated by, you know, Sir Peter Sutherland was the transport commissioner or competition commissioner at the time in 1987. He drove it through. He didn't get agreement from the French government or the German government. We're going to have competition to Air France and Lufthansa. The commission has to drive it through. The commission is the transnational body. The problem is we have a commission that doesn't want to take action. We have a commissioner who, I don't know, I didn't even listen to the, whatever she came up with this morning because I'm sure it was rubbish. Um, is that helpful? But at a certain point in time, it, yeah, We've done two, three years trying to be nice and influence her, but if she doesn't do anything, I think we should at least call her out for failing to do something. She was given a roadmap by Eurocontrol three months ago that said, you know, prioritize the overflights. Take action against European governments when they use minimum service legislation to protect their domestic flights and cancel the European flights. Ursula von der Leyen correctly and valiantly defended the single market during the Brexit negotiations, and yet they allow a couple of French air traffic control units to trash it, not just once a month, it's on a daily basis now. They need to take action, because if national governments won't act, the Commission is there to impose some action on them. And it's the lack of willingness to do anything. You know, there's nothing we can do, it's, uh, it's not our competence. We can't, uh, it's the right to strike. There's not to, nobody's taken away the right to strike. The French air traffic controllers will keep do going. Do you strike. risk? It's just you have to stop protecting the long haul flights and the domestic flights and start protecting some of the overflights. Do you risk people saying, oh, there goes Michael again? We all know Michael. Everybody says, oh, so what? Doesn't mean I'm not right. <laughs> <laughs> just means they don't listen to you. <laughs> Yeah, and as long as they fly with uh, me, it'll sorry? be fine. As long as they fly with me, it'll be fine. <laughs> Maybe you should stop them flying with you. I'll perish the thought. Yeah, and when we look at the, the, the other one, of course, is EU 261. Don't get excited yet. EU 261. I have to say, I, uh, I hear two sides on this. I have tried several EU 261 claims, a few of them over the years, and I've always managed to lose. So I'm doing something wrong. Oh, you it's you, you who are losing. Because I was oh, yeah, I was going to find the one that who was one losing, person actually. Was losing. No, it's, it's me. Richard. Uh, it's me. I, I tried one, but it wasn't against the European carrier. It was with a US carrier across the Atlantic. 
out of the UK, and I, managed, and I got stuck with the extraordinary whatever it is. Um, what, would you, what do you believe is a fair one? <coughs> well, first of all, it, it's got to be clear in the text. It, it, it's so difficult to, to, to understand and read, and you can interpret it in any way you want, and that's what the local courts are doing. And that's why those cases become precedents, and then it just takes on and on, and because there is a natural, and, and that, that's wrong, not wrong in itself, but there's a natural willingness to protect individuals. That's why you're having this unclarity that leads to case after case, and suddenly you have something that is so far what this was meant to do. And by the way, the world has completely changed since it was written as well. So you want to see a protection for, for consumers that is appropriate in the time that we live in right now, that has also fairness with it about you know, the compensation and who should pay for the different things. I mean, we have many cases where we're putting up you know, people in, in hotel rooms that is driven by nothing to do with, with the airline that other you know, players in this sector have, have caused us. There's no way we're going to get those money back. And also the blame reputationally comes on to the airline. Okay, but this is, an, this is an example again of where, to an extent, the Commission has said, or everybody's agreed, that this, it needs reforming and nothing's been done. So how do you... Well, first of all, Carson, why do you think nothing's been done by them? Is it just root of least resistance? And secondly, how do we advance the agenda forward on that? I really have a problem with this kind of debate, sorry. This obviously is the one flagship event the European aviation industry still has. Huh? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not just a lobbying event for the three things we don't get solved, which is six. One is one of single European skies, the other one, and uh, whatever you want to call number three, four, five. Right. We need to switch this around also towards decision makers in Brussels, but not only. If we are considered an industry which is thus complaining about the three remaining open items, I don't think you ever get the energy, including the energy you need to eventually change those three things. So I think we need to really stop doing that. And I think this event here today is more than just dressing, you know, the EU Commission. In my view, it's the flagship event of the European aviation, which is one of the few industries where Europe is still playing on par with other parts of the world. Michael is the southwest of Europe. Okay, the same success story in all modesty. I think Lufthansa is among the top airlines in the world, like the three Americans, like the three Chinese, like the three in the Gulf. Johan, it's an incredible success story of aviation by an entrepreneurial initiative, then taking it to a more professional company. This industry, talk about those people in European restaurants. Where is aviation more fun, in the US or in Europe? Here. So let's take that self com The German car industry also has a few issues they'd like to get solved here. They would never talk as self-critical as we do. I, think, I really think we have to turn that around. And that strength, confidence, will then also allow us to be a little bit more maybe influential on these terrible things we are now discussing since Airlines for Europe was created. But that's not what Airlines for Europe is all about. So what is it about? This lady in Malta impressed me. We are connecting, we have studied many years. Ireland wouldn't be the Ireland of today without aviation. The Baltics wouldn't be an integral part of Europe as they are today without aviation. Tourism industries in many parts of the world, in Europe wouldn't be what they are without aviation. Aviation has done great things to connecting Europe in a way this historically, by the way, very difficult continent has never seen. I think one of the things, and it's been mentioned before, that you know, before the pandemic, I think that the connectivity was taken for granted. I think one of the things that we've seen coming out of the pandemic, and that has been everything from, oh, you know, we're going to change the way we work. You know, we, we had a lots of debate before, are you going to be able to work from home before the pandemic? Now you had to, and now we're coming up with hybrid work, and we see consistently that people are saying, after the pandemic, because they also renovated their houses, they renovated their apartments, they bought their cars, that I now want to travel, I want to experience things. And people are now, as we can see in the demand, which is very good for the summer, that is just coming through. You, you told us a story, I think, this morning when you met some people who, you know, among you know, politicians as well, to say that, look, oh, how much I missed to travel. And they gave a private story on how much they want to travel and want to do it again. That's what we all feel like. Now we just need to create the right framework for that to continue to thrive. That's accepting all of what you've said and accepting all of what you've said. It takes us, though, to the issue 
of why the, or how the industry gets that message out. Which is really what you're saying, because what you're really saying is, this is a tremendous industry that has offered so much and which everybody <laughs> appreciates. Yeah, I think in the end, people want to work for winners, want to fly with winners, and maybe even politicians want to do politics for winners. And the fact that this industry becomes, a, let's say, a landmark industry in Europe, rather than an industry where we have to hide behind what at Asia or the US, I think will help us to also put those policy issues through, which we have been discussing here. How do you do it, though? How do and there's you no single switch. Talk about the jobs we provide, the collectivity we provide. Again, talk about Europeans or whatever, European products. And if somebody buys a watch, he buys a Swiss watch. If somebody buys a car, he buys a German car. If somebody buys a handbag, he buys a French handbag. If somebody wants to fly in style, he flies a European airline. That's how I see our industry to a certain degree. And that's, I think, how you create the traction to also then have impact on policymakers to solve those issues which are not solved yet. By the way, there's no journalist here, right? We are making better margins than ever. Our credibility to wine we can, will we go down, in my view, by that fact alone. I think one of Michael's problems. With that balance sheet, how bad can it be for Ryanair? Not really that bad, right? So I think that's where we are, in my view, also have to work on our credibility as an industry if we are, you know, better than ever before, investing ever better than before, outperforming, at least in our case, non-European airlines better than ever before, and then we say, this is a terrible place to run an airline. I think that's not the credibility which smart people, which we have in this city, will fall for. So I think it's a mixture of strength and hitting on those crazy topics we have been hitting on for so many years, because I fully agree, there's no reason why this shouldn't be solved. But let's do it with some element of pride and strength and not crawling under, under the carpet. Are you crawling under the carpet? No, I agree entirely with what Carson says. I mean, look, I, again, I go back to the, the first point on summer 23. We're all going to do remarkably well this year. We're all going to see dramatic growth, dramatic recovery. Fares are rising. I think they need to rise given the higher oil prices we're all facing post uh, the, uh, the Ukrainian invasion, which we all want to see resolved as quickly as possible. There are some roadblocks. And I think the use of, uh, and the reason why these forums are, are responsible, it's almost to me like a checklist. We come here twice a year. There's an autumn and a spring conference. We ask the commission, what have you done on our shopping list? Depressingly, generally, it's very little. <laughs> but nevertheless, we go away, we get on with the business. I mean, this year, my year finishes on Friday, 31st of March, I carry about 168 million passengers. We're going to carry 185 million passengers in the next 12 months. So even if we have an indolent commission that doesn't deliver much, the airlines and the industry get out there and we deliver the growth and we are, we are bringing huge numbers of people to the beaches, the resorts, the hotels of Europe. We're responsible for huge right. employment. But we need and we expect and we demand action on a couple of simple solutions from the commission and it's disappointing I, that we haven't got them yet. Right, so what I want to focus on for, the sec for a second or two is exactly what you're talking about, Carson, which is, and what you've just said, you come here twice a year with a checklist and it, 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 this, that and the other, and you've got these great success stories. How do you now marry those two up? We so that when you come here, there is progress on whatever issue. And I agree with you, it's tiresome to just re re rehearse year after year those that don't. How do you marry it up? We need to be crystal sharp on the narrative and the message, and there is a new currency in time. There is something about the carbon saving, uh, something about the sustainability agenda that we all can work for and get some wins out of. And I'm talking about the airspace reform in, in particular. We can be better in bringing that story uh, come to life, and also make it clear to the public and the consumer. Th th this is the thing. It becomes very technical when you're talking about the airspace reform. But you have to make sure that the, the people understand, as I you know, showed up in, in, in an earlier debate here as well, that look, is it reasonable because of local politics that we're going to waste 19% or more of CO2 emissions because we can't fly in an optimal way? Mm -hmm. Is that reasonable? That's, that's huge amounts of tons of CO2 emissions that go straight up in there. Who's responsible for that? Well, we know it's local politics involved in that. Here's the other thing about Eurocontrol. Eurocontrol doesn't really have any executive powers. 
they, they are managing the capacities, but they're not the ones who can say, okay, well, that's not working over there. We're going to move that into that corridor over there. They need to get more of the executive powers as well to coordinate this. And that's what we've been calling for. But then, you know, something has got to give in another end. I want to turn to the issue of sustainable or SAFs and, and the other environmental or sustainable issues. How much of your time is spent uh, dealing with, looking at, handling sustainable issues? I mean, my time, not that much, but I mean, as an organization, we have a whole department devoted towards sustainability. We're investing heavily in research with Trinity College in Dublin. But you know, the, the, in reality, we've signed SAF mandates with four suppliers now, Neste, OMG, BP, but the numbers are tiny. You know, if we, the, the, the SAFs that we can procure between now, I think, and 2028 account for less than 1% of our fuel usage over that period. The fundamental issue for all of us, we're all ag would be willing buyers of, uh, of SAFs. We, until you have a sea change in the supply of and the uh, incentivization by European governments to supply more SAFs here, SAF is not going to be the solution. Would you buy more SAFs? at these elevated prices if it was available. Because I was just discussing this with somebody here, and we were talking about, and, and you were making the argument of, you have the incentives. Let's say the incentives are put to the producers. But is that incentive designed to, for them to produce more, or to produce more cars at a lower price, or both? Well, right now, at the mm -hmm. price of five times as much as it is to buy fossil fuels, we at Lufthansa Group buy as much stuff as we can sell on to our passengers or cargo customers. Cargo, by the way, works even better than passengers. A lot of forwarders are now willing to have CO2-free flights. We even have a weekly Frankfurt-Shanghai operation, which this uh, particular forwarder is only doing when we buy enough stuff for that flight, which we do. And remaining volumes we will only buy when the price is where it is for fossil fuels. I mean, how can I waste my shareholders' money on buying more expensive fuel uh, when uh, nobody pays for it. I can't do that. So it, it's, it's five times, in, in Lufthansa, 30% of our cost are fuel. Imagine I would only pay twice for my fuel, then it goes into, not by math. So it's but both, isn't it? You need more and you need it at a lower price. Exactly. But one follows the other. I mean, if you increase supply, you address supply price falls. Yeah. That's the nature of this, the industry. These things are, but in the um, end, this is a global industry. Yeah. There will be global mechanism. It's like, what we just saw on oil or gas, even with the war in Ukraine, the, the market takes one year, then market mechanism swings in. Huh? Adam Smith, the invisible hand. Mm. It's also the invisible hand will also be there for SAF, but not. But the invisible hand needs a help. Which it, which it happens a lot of things. There would be no semiconductors without the US Department of Defense huh? 50 years ago and all that. So these innovations take government intervention because there is no rationale on a business view to make this planet cleaner. That's why we need to have joint forces to do it. It's not the market driving us, unfortunately. You, you know, it, when, when you ask that question, how much time do you spend on, you know, uh, you know, sustainability? I think we're actually spending every minute on it, on how to become more efficient. Because frankly, that, that is what it is. You, you, there's nothing you don't do to think about how can I save fuel? How can I get into you know, saving costs through you know, lose, um, uh, wasting less, as an example? And that's whole part of that whole thing. It's not just about spending time on one out of these things. We all spend time on efficiency. The other point about the, 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 the reason why this is difficult to somehow how have a discussion about it, say, well, why don't you just pay it? Because, you know, if it's the fourth, six times, but it's only a mandate of five and six, well, that, that cost is going to end up somewhere. And you can say, well, it's going to end up one way or the other, or part of it, or half of it, or if it goes into hurting your profit, you're not going to be able to invest into the new technologies, the new planes you're going to need. If it ends up on the prices, you're basically going to make sure that this industry goes back to what was before deregulation, only for rich and privileged people. So you, you can't have both of these things. You gotta make sure that there's enough money. And after the three years of mayhem that this industry have felt with all the billions of losses that exist across the whole of the sector, you know, we need to be able to come back and cover the cost. And when we're then asked to then buy fuels that are four to five times more expensive, is it gonna come out that returns to the shareholders who have been suffering, or is it gonna come out to the prices to the customers so they're not gonna fly? Good. 
we are offering CO2 neutral flying in Lufthansa, okay? All the way up to buying 100% SAF, which technically the airplane, of course, cannot do, but that's not how we do it. Out of 100 passengers, four choose to pay extra to fly all the way up to 100% CO2 neutral. Most take a mix. 96 say, I don't want to pay for it. I take the ticket without the extra burden. That's also part of the truth. Right. So in this room, who are you? I was you? just about to do exactly that. And again, uh. this is very thin ice. I know and my communication director probably is sweating now, but uh, <laughs> oh, let's have also a little bit more an honest approach. You can do it with it's me, a, Carl. And I know I can. I have it's never, a, I, have, so I do not tick the box. And by the way, right now in Lufthansa, for those of you who want to fly with us, we do have stuff available for those who want to bring this from 4 to 5%. We just brought it up by introducing green fares as the first mover in the industry. Enormous success, number of people willing to pay more to fly CO2 neutrally has gone up. But even with the fares we have as a premium airline, even in first class, not 100% choose to fly CO2 neutral. Where you pay 15,000 euros for a first class ticket and it's only 500 extra to fly CO2 neutral. That's the truth. And it's absolute fine. I love also these 96% passengers as I love the 4% who compensate. I love them all. But that's the voters in this continent. It's the people living in Europe, people living in 26 European countries, people, Michael, Johan and I sometimes compete on the lower end. Michael, you know it better, five euros more, passengers switch to another airline. So let's, let's not try to be too, you know, Catholic here, as we say in Germany. I don't know if that works also in Belgium, that saying. Uh, but um, we are running businesses. We are. I think we are proud to what we have achieved. New airplanes, newer airplanes, the engineers in the room, Boeing, Airbus, Pratt and Whitney, wonderful work being done to reduce the CO2. But now it's up to the voters, to the public, to the passengers, to the consumers in other industries to decide if they want to put their money on that. How many people in this room regularly tick whatever box it is on the airline they're traveling to go carbon neutral? Probably four out of a hundred if you're the average No, we've group. got three, four. A few more, which makes sense. You're better educated probably in this regard. Also, maybe generally better educated, but in this <laughs> regard. Uh, than the average person so, there. Maybe there's a little bit higher income in this room than by in the average. So there could probably be more than 4% in this room. But it's not going to be 40, as we just saw. It's the trick is how to increase that. That's the challenge. You got an answer? I disagree. I don't think the trick. The trick is how do we increase the supply, the sustainable the supply of SAF. So that's the most. Look, if, if you, hang on, no, you think about no, it. No, no, no. We are spending huge amounts of money as an industry, and in these individuals, the three companies you have on the stage here, we're spending unprecedented amounts of money on new aircraft technology. I mean, I'm taking delivery of Max 8200s now that carry. There's four percent more seats. They burn 16 percent less fuel. There's never been a kind of technological revolution like it. 16 percent less fuel. I don't need an environmental incentive. If I can reduce my fuel consumption by 16%, I'm all over it like a, rash, like a rash. We are doing everything we can. The only way we're going to get to net carbon zero by 2050, because there isn't going to be another step change in technology between now and then, is SAFs. And the issue we challenge we face with SAFs is unless European governments act like the Americans, get behind incentivizing the production of SAFs and the consumption of SAFs, we're not going to get there. If the producers of SAF know that you are gagging to fill your planes with as much SAF as you can get, why do you think they're not producing more? The, the infrastructure isn't there at the moment. The incentives for those producers aren't there. I mean, you look at what the administration has done in the, in the States to incentivize not just SAFs, car, sustainable energy, solar, um, uh, wind and rain. We don't have anything structural or simultaneous like that here in Europe. Europe uh, is asleep at the wheel and we need to do more and go faster. Let me give you a technical answer also. Even if they wanted to produce more and even if we bought it all, we don't have the green electricity to do it. So it doesn't make sense to take you know, electricity produced by coal, by coal power plants to turn it into SAF. Yeah, it's absolutely crazy in terms of physics. I have an electric car, or I have a hybrid car, and my kids love it when I drive it electric. It's, for the environment, stupid, because half of the electricity in Germany where I live comes from fossil fuels. The efficiency of my car is much less than 
50%. So the cleanest way for me to drive is to leave that hybrid element out and put gas in, which my kids, being teenage girls, don't like. And I, even I don't like it because it doesn't feel well. But it's stupid. The electricity I put in my car comes from a German coal power plant or we buy it from France because they have nuclear power. Um, that's just another part of the story. So let's, we all agree <laughs> that we need to go that way. And one day, all the electricity in the world has to be 100%. Don't take me wrong. Individually, I have electricity on my roof because I want to pay my part and I can afford to pay my part to contribute. But it's not the case if we just now produce the volumes we need in Lufthansa. Only Lufthansa. If they were produced in to, towards south, I need half of the German electricity. One company, just the Luft. We, I need half of the German electricity to create SAF for the Lufthansa Group, which, by the way, is half which we have renewable in Germany. I would need the other half, which is fossil. So this is much bigger than what we want, even what our customers want. We need to think in Europe. That's what I told Mr. Timmermans yesterday. How do you want to produce that SAF? They will not come out of Europe. We need to go to Africa, Chile. This, this is huge. And here is the airline. Is it doable? Not within whatever five years, but it must be doable. The planet needs it. At least that's my modest view. But this is really, this is where I'm with Michael. This is what politicians are there for, to do things we alone cannot do. Of course, we can afford to buy a little bit more stuff. You will not go bankrupt. I will not go bankrupt. We look good. That's not what it's really about. We need I'll assume you won't go bankrupt. No, 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 no. He won't go bankrupt. <laughs> it's, 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 but it's just, it's just in case. I, the I, volumes. I can assure millions of customers around the Europe that that won't happen. Are your customers, following okay. on from what you said, are your customers saying one thing and doing another? They're saying they want these things, but does their actions suggest that they do? Is pressure coming from your passengers to, to, to do this? And when it does come, are they actually living up to it themselves? Well, I read, maybe it was even Airlines for Europe, in a survey, 70% of passengers said, I want airlines to fly CO2 neutral. 20% said they are willing to pay more. At least in our company, 4% do. Which, by the way, is also the problem for politicians in other topics. In Germany, big debate on heating houses. Big suggestion, let's modernize all the houses. It's going to cost a lot of money for the guy going to the early shift in the factory. Is he not going to go on a vacation to equip his house? Some do, some don't. So this is a political society topic, which is much bigger than what we as European airlines do. Again, while we are doing what we can, I don't want to no. But the, one of the problems is that w what people sometimes say is not actually what they do. It, it's, we, that's, we know that's the case. If, if people were doing exactly what they were telling us to do in surveys, then it would be a different thing. And you can't also blame them. We're living in a cost of living crisis. We're living in a, in a situation where there are tons of challenges for families and for people to you know, pay their bills right. because of electricity. So, you know, if you ask them to say, look, do you want to live in, you know, and, and fly with sustainability and it's going to cost you X, they might say yes, but when it comes to it, they got a life to get by on, on an everyday basis. And this is, this is millions of people who live in this whole thing. So you can't expect them either right. just to say, to do this right now. That's why there needs to be politicians who start doing some investment and take some of the taxes or all of the taxes that are collectively call, you know, to be sustainable and start putting it into these type of investments. I want to end with a thought of, on the thought of how you now move this forward, because you're right in a sense that the issues are known, the environment is known, I mean, the, 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 the political environment is known, so how do you now, so that when we're here this time, Maybe a year is not going to make any difference, but over the progress is made. What's the take? What's the next thing? Start with you, Jürgen. I, I think it's, you know, like I said, I keep repeating myself. I do think that the fact that we can sharpen up the narrative to say that, look, you know, in terms of decarbonizing this industry, these things need to happen. And I think that has a different type of gravity to it and, and, and weight than any other things that we might have talked about before. Michael? I think we will all collectively deliver a year of very strong growth. I expect uh, we'll grow strongly, 
this time here next year, Carsten will own my main competitor in the Italian market and we'll have more um, choice. Uh, do you relish not, that? Not, I do. I love competition, particularly with Carsten. You will get it. You uh, will get it. No, no. Um, but uh, we shouldn't lose sight of it. This is a very innovative, creative, dynamic, entrepreneurial industry. And we will go away from here for the next six months and we'll do what we do and we'll compete like hell with each other. And I think we'll deliver a terrific service for our customers. Our customers will, in, will travel in huge numbers this summer. We will still come back here in six months' time. We'll still be beating up on the commission, on the issues that where we have failed to see any delivery, any reform of airport or charge directive. There's been no reform of uh, single skies, and we still haven't got reform of EU 261, but we'll keep coming back. But it doesn't delay or, I think, in any way, the growth that we're delivering. It doesn't stop us investing in new aircraft. It doesn't stop us in moving our own environmental agenda forward because it is an incredibly creative, dynamic industry run by incredibly creative, dynamic, and I would say, attractive chief executives uh, and we're you know but we're they just, couldn't make it today <laughs> they're all here <laughs> they're there's busy a, running the, the company they're, they're too busy right yeah, there's a few out there in the audience they're too busy being successful <laughs> so let's be positive and, uh, and i see philip cornelis is here who's going to be speaking later on today to tell us how he is going to deliver this reform of uh, airport charges uh, eu 261 and do something about french air traffic control before we get here in september you get the last word. <laughs> As always. I, uh, <laughs> but at home. I see uh, <laughs> three things. First, as I alluded, you have to be successful. Successful industries are listened to. As a German, I think, look at the German car industry, chemical industry, mechanical engineering. The most successful industries are also the one most listened to. You could turn that around, but I don't. Second one is facilitate efficiency towards our customers. So we do introduce green fares. We make it easier to pay the surplus on aviation on SAF, which we know makes it easier for passengers to make the choice, which I want to bring it up from 4% to maybe one day 100. And um, last but not least, I think honesty. I think aviation has one huge advantage to other industries. Look at the banks. We can't lie like that because it's about, day, it's about life and death what we do every day. Huh? The culture of an airline must be, in the end, an honest culture about failures which are not repeated, safety, all that we do, knock on wood, to make this amazing safety record we are also proud of. So I think there is an element of honesty, fact-drivenness in airlines. Let's use that to our advantage, including forums like today, to bring the message honestly across, and then eventually I think the world around us will move. Ladies and gentlemen, the panel. Well done. Well done. Thank you, sir. Well done.